Good afternoon, or at least good afternoon to those of you in the UK. Good morning to those of you in the States. And who knows what goes on in Australia? Nobody quite follows it today. It's nice to have you all with us today. We have a really good webinar coming up. I'm, I, I am really into this subject at the moment for numerous reasons. We're going to be talking about dark patterns, why they suck, and what we can do instead. And this has come about partly for two reasons. Firstly, I am running a workshop in London, full day workshop uh, with a small group of people where what we're going to do for that day um, is we're going to learn about conversion rate optimization and how you can do that without annoying people. And we're going to dive into your sites and we're going to explore them and we're going to talk about different ways of improving them. If that is something you're interested in, then Somewhere about here, I believe, is a nice big call to action that tells you all about that. But the other reason that I wanted to do this workshop um, is because, not workshop, webinar, um, is because I'm writing a book on conversion rate optimization as well. And so it's all going around in my head at the moment. And I thought a great way of getting that out of my head would be to um, run a, a webinar about it and, and start discussing it a little bit. So thank you so much for turning up. Um, let's uh, let's show my screen and then bring up the presentation and all of that good stuff. Why isn't it a lot of me? There we go. Okay, so we are screen sharing. Why dark patterns suck and what we can do about them. So um, this is what we're going to be covering today. If you have a question while I'm talking, down the bottom of the screen, if you're watching it live, of course, down the bottom of the screen, you will see a ask the question option. Please do not put questions in the chat as I won't see them um, and your question will disappear. If you put it in the bottom, then I can address all the questions at the end. I can't actually see the chat while I'm giving the presentation. It's an annoying shortfall um, of this particular platform. But anyway, here we go. Let's dive into uh, today's presentation. So we want to talk about dark patterns, but before we can talk about pa dark patterns, we need to talk about what they are, because I think there's some misunderstanding around this particular topic. Everybody's talking about dark patterns um, these days, but there's some differences about how they're being described. For me, a dark pattern is a user interface element that has been carefully crafted to trick the user into doing something they might not otherwise do, often by the means of some psychological manipulation of some kind. So let me give you some examples of dark patterns, and then hopefully that will make it clear about what is and what isn't a dark pattern. So here is a mock-up that I created for you, right? I can pretty much manipulate people into doing whatever I want online within within reason. So for example, um, these shoes, this pair of shoes, I could easily persuade you to take out insurance for these shoes. Who buys insurance for shoes? Who would ever do anything so stupid? But you can do it. And the way that you can do it, as you can see from those two buttons at the bottom, is we have two buttons, one that says add to basket with insurance, right? And another one that says add to basket without insurance. So I'm giving the, both options. It's not like I'm forcing people to do anything. But of course, people are going to click on that add to basket with insurance because people don't read. I'm relying on the fact that people are too busy, too hurried, uh, too distracted to pay attention to anything other than the visual cues. And the visual cues say I'm supposed to click that green button it's got a, you know it's bright green which is a go sign a positive sign and it's pointing um a you know forward right and you keep going forward don't you you know if you want to buy you go forward you wouldn't click on the grayed out button that goes backwards that makes no sense so you can manipulate people into doing pretty much whatever you want them to do um, now, this is just a mock-up that I created, but you can see examples of this kind of manipulation all the time online. So, for example, Etsy. All right, I was recently looking to buy myself a retro industrial flamethrower on Etsy, as one does. And uh, as I was looking, I wasn't really. I just picked it because it was a nice image. Um, as I was looking at these things, I saw this message, almost gone. There's only one of these left, 
right? And just to just to really drive home that point, they said that three people have added this to their cart and 63 people have favorited it. If I don't act soon, it's going to be gone. I'm going to have missed that opportunity to buy my industrial style flamethrower table lamp as it, it is a table. It, the, 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 ignore the product. So you see what I mean? Right. We've used psychology to manipulate people by creating a sense of scarcity. Right. Oh, there's only one left. I've got to order it now. But let's not just pick on Etsy. This is something that we see all over the place on the Internet. But I think it's also important to stress on stress what isn't a dark pattern. So I see a lot of articles written on dark patterns at the moment, and and they they say things like this is about oh an overlay that's not a dark pattern right it's not seeking to manipulate people right all it's doing is just annoying them and that's a whole different thing but I think it's really important that we differentiate between annoying behavior and dark patterns, right? Dark patterns use psychology to manipulate you into doing something that you don't want to do, right? So, and, and like I said, I'm seeing a lot of articles written about uh, dark patterns, like this one from UX Planet, right? It's downright unethical and irresponsible, okay? And it is entirely right. I agree with everything that's written in this article, but I think that they're missing the point, right? Yes, we should be talking about ethics, but ethics is somewhat in the eye of the beholder, right? And you can argue, you could argue about that all you want, and whether ethics is a, a, a thing set in stone or whether it's something that is culturally appropriate or down to the individual or whatever else. I don't want to get into any of those discussions. To be honest, I just don't care, right? But here's the thing. You can convince yourself of anything. If I'm a marketer, right, and I'm, I'm under enormous pressure to, to, um, to increase my conversion rate, to make my targets, right, I can easily convince myself that actually something like this is perfectly acceptable, right? That I'm not using a dark pattern, that it's not unethical. After all, I'm giving them the option not to go for the insurance. So we can convince ourselves that our behavior um, is ethical or isn't unethical or irresponsible. So actually, I think making talking about dark patterns as being ethical or unethical is entirely the wrong way to approach it. And that's not what I want to do in this article, uh, not article, webinar. I'm not about to start lecturing you about the rights and wrongs of, of using these kinds of techniques. Instead, what I'm going to talk about is why dark patterns are bad for business, right? Because they are. They're fundamentally damaging to your business. And we need to be aware of that. OK, and we need to realize that because if we don't realize that we could actually cause more harm than good by using dark patterns. So that's what I want to explore. And then I'm going to get on to what we should be doing instead. OK, so dark patterns are bad for business. Well, why? I mean, because after all, they do work. That's the thing, right? How can you say they're bad for um, business, Paul, if they work? And they do. There is no doubt about it that um, you can uh, trick people into doing stuff. And sure enough, your conversion rate will go up. So let's not pretend that they don't work. But that doesn't mean we need to fall back on, oh, they're unethical or not nice for users which are all very subjective. And to be honest, most businesses just don't give a monkeys about ethics anyway. As marketers and other digital um, specialists, we find ourselves under increasing pressure from senior management to meet targets. And so it's hardly surprising that people turn to dark patterns as the answer in this kind of situation. They work, but they come at a cost. Right. And I'm going to give you three business reasons against dark patterns. Right. Reasons that you can take back into your organization and you can talk about as reasons not to be adopting this kind of uh, approach. Right. So we start with this one. Consumers are cynical. They're savvy and they're spoilt for choice. 
Okay. Now, how does this apply to dark patterns? Right. Here's booking.com, renowned as being um, uh, a manipulative site. Okay. Look at it. You know, look at this. I'm looking down um, uh, a, a particular um, um, a hotel and looking at the different room types. Look how much that they're, they're playing off of that same scarcity that um, uh, Etsy did. Only six rooms left. Expires in a certain length of time. You know, 21 people looking at this now. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Buy, buy, buy. Okay? And that works. And sure enough, booking.com is hugely successful. And so it's easy for us to conclude, therefore, that because these techniques work, that they manipulate people, that people are unaware of the fact that they're being manipulated. After all, if you're being manipulated, right, you're not going to do it if you're aware of it. It requires you to be unaware. Or does it? Now, interestingly, I did some usability testing on booking.com and I observed an interesting thing. Most of the people that I was testing with on the site were completely aware that the site was attempting to manipulate them. Here's one quote from one particular research subject. I hate all this manipulative crap trying to convince me the room is about to sell out. I just ignore that stuff, right? He may think he just ignores that stuff, but on a subconscious level, it is impacting him. It's making him um, rush his decision-making process, even though he's aware of it. And this fact that people are actually aware of dark patterns and manipulation is key because it means that you're pissing people off. You're upsetting people by doing this manipulative crap. And we need to be aware of that. There is this assumption that we make that if we use dark patterns, people are unaware they're being manipulated and so therefore it's okay, right? There will be no ramifications. And that is just not true, right? And in fact, this is becoming such a big thing that governments are beginning to step in. Even governments are aware that dark patterns are out there. So the, um, the CMA is a, a, a standards body here in the UK. And, and they wrote, um, the CMA has taken enforcement action to bring to an end misleading sales tactics, hidden charges and other practices in the online booking market. These are wholly unacceptable. So the problem that you have here is if you, uh, if you adopt dark patterns, you start to create a, um, a negative view of your brand um, and your site and all the rest of it, okay? And that has enormous consequences because um, one disgruntled customer can cause real damage to your brand. But more than that, each and every one of your customers has an overwhelming number of choices. Look how many, if you type in hotel bookings, look how many options there are on Google. Other places you can go to book that maybe aren't as manipulative, right? So actually falling back on, um, on dark patterns makes people aware and drives them elsewhere. It drives them to your competition. But also that one disgrunt disgruntled customer can seriously damage your brand. It only takes one person to decide that they're so hacked off with your manipulative techniques that they're going to take action and things can quickly go badly wrong. So, for example, right, people, there are review sites now. Many, many places people can go and have a moan about you and say how crap the experience was and how dissatisfying it was. And that creates a real danger for brands. But also, increasingly, it can have major, major impacts, right? If, if your consumers are not happy for whatever reason, right, including dark patterns, then it can cause problems. So take, for example, uh, the story of Hassin Saeed, right? Hassin Saeed's father um, had his luggage lot lost by British Airways. And so um, British 
um, Airways didn't really respond or didn't help and they were unhelpful. Um, I mean, it was a frustrating experience for Hassan Saeed as he was trying to get his father's uh, luggage back. So what he did in the end, he took out a promoted tweet. One person took out a promoted tweet and complained about British Airways customer service. So whenever somebody uh, searched on um, uh, you know, British Airways, they got back a tweet saying, don't fly British Airways, the customer service is horrendous. And this got picked up by the BBC, it got picked up by Mashable. We cannot afford to upset customers in today's world. Another great example of that was back in the late 90s um, when a guy called um, uh, Jarvis, oh, I can't remember his second name, um, uh, Jarvis wrote an article called My Dell Hell about his bad experience with Dell. And that galvanized a whole movement of other people who were dissatisfied with their experience with uh, Dell. And as a result, it knocked about a third off of Dell share prices. So alienating customers is incredibly dangerous and dark patterns are a superb way to go about alienating your audience. Just take Facebook. Facebook have now been forced to apologize for some of the psychological manipulation they've been doing. The consumer is savvy. They're not stupid. If you're aware of dark patterns, so are they. And we can no longer um, uh, do these things with impunity thinking that there isn't going to be consequences. And the biggest consequence of all of user, um, using dark patterns is buyer's remorse, right? Think about it. Imagine that scenario of my shoes from earlier, right, with the insurance. Do we, do, do we honestly believe that if we trick people into buying insurance that they're going to be happy about that? Of course not. Of course they're going to be shocked right? Of course, they're going to be frustrated. And of course, they're going to be angry, angry. And that has consequences that we don't always see. And the reason we don't always see is because of the way our organizations are structured, right? There are hidden costs to dark patterns that are not uh, visible. So your UX, your digital team, your e-com team, whatever you want to call them, are really happy. They've improved conversion rate. Right, great. We've boosted our conversion rate by adopting some dark patterns. Well done, us. But meanwhile, marketing are finding completely coincidentally that their marketing costs are increasing. They're having to work harder to get the same amount of traffic to the website. Why is that? Well, it could well be because you're having to counteract all of those negative reviews, all of that negativity that exists around your brand. So there is an increase in marketing costs associated with the dark patterns you've been employing. But it doesn't stop there. Also, the support team are getting a num uh, an increased number of support calls. They don't know why. Suddenly, everybody's ringing up asking for insurance to be removed. It's not their, um, their business or their concern to question that. They just have to deal with the additional load and hire more staff. So there's a cost in support as well. And then also, there's a cost of returns. Insurance isn't, isn't too bad compared to some things. But if it's a physical add-on that you've added, all of that needs to be restocked. A delivery has to be taken, delivery has to be paid, everything else. There is a big cost to using dark patterns. It's just that it's a cost that's not immediately visible to the people implementing the dark patterns. And I can give you a real example of this, right? I uh, worked with a client that sold um, electronic goods, uh, kind of household uh, appliances. So one of their big sellers was kettles. And somebody in marketing had this great idea of, well, why don't we bundle filters with these kettles, right? Sure enough, they sold more filters than they'd ever had before. And they were over the moon. What a great success. They didn't ask people whether they wanted these filters or not. They just added them, just like that insurance was added. What they weren't aware of is that people were ringing up asking for their um, the, the, their money back on the filters. They didn't want the filters because they knew that they can get non-branded filters 
uh, cheaper elsewhere online. Okay. Every time one of those people rang up, it cost the business three pounds, right? Because that's how much it costs to ring to the business. Now, the filters cost less than that. And then add to that the fact that those items then had to be returned, okay, and restocked. And suddenly they were losing money. The dark pattern was actually losing that business money. Okay, so all right, we can't use dark patterns, right? But the people that are suggesting dark patterns to us are proposing that we use them, they're encouraging us to use them, need something. They need to you know, meet their targets. They need an alternative. We can't just say no to them. That's just such a negative approach. We need to offer them alternatives. Now, I'm doing a whole day workshop on this. So obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover all of that. Now, I'm writing an entire book on it. I'm not going to be able to cover it all. But I just want to highlight a few things that are great starting points. First of all, we need to look at reducing risk to the user and building trust, right? They are incredibly powerful ways of improving conversion, right? Because we are really risk adverse. And as we've already established, very cynical. So trust doesn't come easy these days. So how can we go about reducing risk and building trust? We do business with people we trust. We, we, um, we will um, uh, convert when we don't feel in danger, when we don't feel a risk associated with that. So let's explore that a little bit more. Okay. Well, the first thing you can do is offer an outrageously good return policy. And I'm going to give a slightly controversial example of this uh, with Love Honey. Don't know whether you're, you're aware of Love Honey, but as you can see from the screenshot, they sell sex toys, right? And they're, they're aiming at selling sex toys to people that have never bought a sex toy before, right? Um, and so they, they know that the risk for people is really high. They feel funny about it. They feel nervous about it, right? About buying a sex toy. What if they don't like it? <gasps> what if the package splits and the postman sees what's in it? What's going to appear on my credit card statement that my girlfriend might see? So all of these are concerns and they address them all head on, but their best, right? Their best by far is their return policy. You can buy a sex toy and then if you don't like it, you can return that sex toy, right? Up to a year later, get your full money back and they pay postage both ways. What an incredible return policy. Don't worry. I know what you're thinking. They don't resell the sex toy once it's been returned. They recycle it. But what an incredible, uh, uh, incredible example of reducing the risk. So my question for you is, how could you reduce the risk for your users? How could you reassure them? And that can uh, apply to any type of conversion. So, for example, on my own website, if you go to boagworld.com and you go down to my newsletter sign up, right? Signing up for a newsletter is a risk. Um, are they going to spam me? What they? How often am I going to get emails? Um, what if I don't like it, right? What are they going to do with my email address? And you'll find that I've addressed all of those things in my copy. I tell them how often they're going to receive um, emails from me. I'm going to tell them they can unsubscribe in one click. And I tell them that they can, um, uh, uh, that I will never pass their email address to a third party. I make it abundantly clear and reduce the risk. That's one of the best things you can do. If you want to increase conversion, don't bother with dark patterns reduce the risk and build trust. So here's an example, exactly what I'm talking about um, uh, with my newsletter. Every two weeks, right? So the amount of time you will, um, how often you will receive it, right? You will receive support improving your site by creating a better user experience and more effective digital strategy. So there I'm telling them what they're going to get. You can unsubscribe in one click and I will never share your email address. This is known as objections, right? Objection handling. 
People have objections, reasons they're nervous or reluctant to take action. So we just address them head on. Sometimes that's going to involve, um, you know, maybe introducing a return policy or doing some kind of organizational change. But oftentimes it's simply taking the time to explain what's going to happen. What's um, so that it's not a surprise. It's not the unknown. It becomes knowable. So we've got unsubscribe in one click. Deadly simple. Pricing is another really good example of this, right? Oftentimes, um, pricing is so um, uh, opaque. It's so hard to understand what the pricing is and what the pricing means, right? Are there hidden costs? How many times have you been on an e-commerce site? You found a product you like, you've added it to the basket. Oh, and suddenly there's a delivery charge, right? That completely undermines trust. Users feel like they're being lied to. So it's much better to be transparent, open, and honest if you want to improve your conversion rate. That is far more effective. People will stick. You will get repeat business if you build trust and, and reliability. And let's be honest, right? If you trick, you know, if you were that person tricked into buying shoes with insurance, would you ever? go with them again? Of course not. They damage the relationship. They've undermined the relationship. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the marketing team has to constantly find new customers. Their level of retention is incredibly low. But here's the problem, right? It's really costly to win new customers compared to getting repeat business, people buying again and again and again. So being transparent and open is far more effective, actually, for building a long-term sustainable business. Now, you probably know this. I'm not probably telling you anything you don't already know in terms of you provide a great outstanding experience, you, um, uh, you, um, you know, you're transparent, you're open, all those things. You know that already. But notice the way that I'm wording it. Noticing the notice the way that I'm framing all of this all the time. It's about the monetary benefit all the time. It's about the business benefit. Just saying, oh, we want to create a great user experience is not enough. You have to show how that is going to provide clear business benefit. Uh, plain English, right? All the time. Again, this is another aspect of reducing risk. OK, most people's privacy policies, for example, I'm just picking this as a random example, but most people, most websites, privacy policies aren't anything to do with improving people's privacy. It's all to do with ask covering on behalf of the business. And people read this, see this gobbledygook, right, of legalese, and it just feels devious and deceptive and ask covering. People aren't stupid. But if you write a plain English privacy policy, you build trust, you build rapport, you build relationship. And that is why people buy. People buy from places they trust, from people that they trust, right? Another way of building trust is to be easily contactable, right, and provide a fast response. One of the reasons that Zappos has become so incredibly popular is because there's this safety net all of the time, right? Oh, I know I can instantly get hold of somebody if I'm if I get stuck, right? 24-7, they're there, I'm ready to go, right? So you're reducing risk, but at the same time being open and trusting, right? Because because how many sites have you been to that hide the telephone number? Oh, we don't want you to talk to us. Well, that's exactly the opposite you need to be doing if you want to increase conversion. You need to provide that safety net, that reassurance to people. So that is um, uh, about how to reduce risk and how to um, uh, build trust. But I want to come back to this thing of objection handling, right? Because this is absolutely key. There's a bit of a misunderstanding. Um, uh, uh, when it comes to digital and and the web, your web, websites, people 
uh, uh, carrying across a lot of the old mentality from the, the pre-digital era where marketing was primarily about grabbing people's attention, right? We live in a different world now. If someone is visiting your website, you don't need to convince them of their need for the product. The very fact that they've gone to your website is proof that they already see value in the product. And it's also proof that they already see some value in you and your ability to deliver the product. So it becomes a very different game. The game is now about answering their questions and handling their objections. And that will create a big difference in your conversion rate if you double down on answering users' questions and handling their objections. So how do we do that? Well, you can do things like top task analysis. The very first thing you should be doing is establishing, well, what are those questions? What are those objections? So if you haven't come across top, uh, top task analysis before, it's a technique by a guy called Jerry McGovern. And if you search on top task analysis, a list apart, you'll find a great article that talks it through. But essentially what you're doing is you're identifying areas that people are, are interested in and you're getting those uh, uh, people to rank those areas as what's most important to them or what's least important to them. And this is really important because um, there are so many questions that someone might have about your products and services and so many objections and they won't all be equal, right? Typically, a top task analysis gives you something like this. There's actually a very small proportion of top tasks, Jerry calls them, but in our case, questions, objections. A very small number of things, things that are deal breakers, that are most important to people, that they desperately want to know. And then there are a lot of other things that they're, they're interested in to relatively different degrees, right? We need to make sure that those answers are available to those top questions, those top objections, that they're easily available, that they're obvious, that they're front and center in the way that we present ourselves online. And to do that, we need to know what they are. Do you really know what the user's top objections to buying your product or service are? How confident are you in that? And that's where something like a top task analysis can be really valuable. But you could also, if you want to know what people's objections are, just ask them. So another thing that I provide, as well as my London workshop, is I, I have a, an online master class, four hours discussing this kind of topic and, and how to encourage people to complete calls to action. And so when I launched that, I wanted to know what the problem was, right? Why more people weren't converting? It was converting at a reasonable rate, but yeah, I wanted it more and better. And, and so I ran a very simple survey, a survey that displayed only on exit intent because I didn't want to get something in the way of people potentially actually enrolling, right? So as people went to leave, I asked them one question. If you decide not to enroll today, it would be useful to know why. And I listed a load of reasons why I felt that people might not be signing up for my course, right? And that was massively insightful. Just by asking one question, I got to understand the real objections, the real reasons why, why people weren't buying, and then adapt accordingly, right? So know what your users' objections are. Another thing that you can do to um, encourage people um, to, to convert is reduce their cognitive load, right? In other words, don't make me think the Steve Crew book. But I think, yeah, and we all know this, right? We all know that we should have simple, easy to use websites. But let's spend just a second looking at why that is so profound for the buying experience, right? And to do that, you need to understand a little bit about human psychology, okay? We have two parts to our thinking, two parts of our decision-making process, right? So, so whenever we're faced with the decision of what to buy, whether to act, whether to sign up to that newsletter, whatever, there are two systems that we use to do that, right? The first one is system one. System one is our fast, automatic, and intuitive an emotional mode of thinking, right? We make the vast majority of our daily um, decisions with system one, right? 
So system one decides whether I take a drink of my, my, my drink now, right? You don't think about that. You don't consider it. System one is used to recall information as well. If I say, what's two plus two, you don't sit there working it out. You just remember it's four, right? System one will tell you what the capital of France is as well. So system one is all the automatic, fast, quick thinking stuff, right? The, the, when we say don't make me think, we're talking about system one. So, for example, driving a car, right? When you first start driving a car, it's hard and it's complicated and we have to think about it. Eventually, we hardly remember the route we took to work or the journey. And that's because we've moved it into system one from system two. System two is our what most of us would refer to as our conscious brain, our thinking brain. So it's slower, it's more effortable, effortful, and it's deliberate. So we use our more logical system too for decisions we have to constantly make, uh, sorry, consciously make, right? So it's a limited resource that easily gets depleted and tired. So we much prefer to make decisions in system one to system and two because system one is effortless right? So how does all of this come back to conversion rate optimization, improving the conversion rate on your site? Well, the harder we have to think, the higher our cognitive load, right? That has certain consequences. So we all know the things that improve, uh, that, that cause high cognitive load, inconsistencies in our user interface, you know, a confusing interface, being poorly prepared, you know, things unexpected happening um, that we weren't ready for. And actually our mood, if we're in a bad mood, that can also um, increase our cognitive load. And I get into this in a lot more detail, obviously in the masterclass and that kind of thing, but that's enough for now. But it has interesting consequences, right? As our cognitive load goes up, as we have to start thinking, system two kicks in, right? And system two is a miserable Git, right? So for a start, everything's going to feel like hard work, right? And we don't like hard work, okay? Everything's going to feel familiar, unfamiliar as well, right? I don't like this. This doesn't feel quite right. I'm not quite comfortable with this. It's going to feel bad. But most of all, it's going to feel untrue. System two is cynical. System two looks for problems, looks for issues, looks for challenges. So what all of this means is that we don't want system two to kick into gear, right? We want people to feel in, uh, make intuitive, comfortable, easy decisions. And that is why it's so important to create a clean, simple interface, right? That's, you know, you're, you, you've got that intrinsic knowledge that we don't want things to be busy or complicated or overwhelming people, right? That's why UI, good UI design is so important. But that's the psychology behind it. That if system two kicks into gear, our chances of converting will plummet. So there is a good solid reason to create a seamless experience. That is why people love Amazon right? That's why Amazon does so well, because people don't have to think. Now, interestingly, it's not because Amazon is particularly easy to use, right? There are certainly better interfaces. There are certainly cleaner interfaces, but they have one distinct advantage. And that one distinct advantage is that it's familiar. People know it, right? People have learned to use it. So now what's happened is like driving a car, it's been moved from system two, which is really difficult when you first start doing it, to being a sub a subconscious or unconscious and being managed by system one. Amazon is, is so familiar that it's now managed by system one. You don't have that luxury. People aren't as familiar with your product or service. And so in your case, every single element on your website needs to justify its inclusion because if you don't justify its inclusion if it, if it doesn't really need to be there it's going to just increase your cognitive load slightly now i know what you're thinking oh well you know we've done 
usability testing and and uh, people find our website easy to use and we look at it we look at it and it's easy to use but there's a big difference between you or even a user in a usability test environment looking at your website and the real world because in in those environments that you're describing you're giving that website your full attention all of system two is focused on that website okay and so of course they understand it understands it but in the real world it doesn't work like that you're on a bus you've got toddlers screaming in the background you've got a cat that's just jumped on your lap you've got 28 different tabs open we very rarely get the user's full attention. And so as a result, their, their cognitive load is already high before they even visit our website. So every element should justify its inclusion. And that means that we have to remove, you know, first of all, we need to ask ourselves, can we remove this element? What would the impact be if we just took this off the page? If we really can't remove it, we ask ourselves, can we hide it? Can I hide this element deeper in the site or visually on the page? Okay. So, for example, let's say you've got lots of categories of products, right, on your website. Maybe you could simplify those, those categories. But if you can't simplify them for whatever reason, perhaps only display the top six by default and then have a more tab for the others, right? So that's visually hiding stuff. If you can't hide it, can we shrink this element so it doesn't distract from more important content? So going back to those categories, maybe we have the top six bigger and more prominent and then the lesser selling categories smaller. So every element needs to justify its inclusion and we need to systematically look at every element and ask ourselves, can we remove it? Can we hide it? Can we shrink it in an attempt to bring that cognitive load down? We also, the other big problem I see with cognitive load is we, we ask people to do too many things simultaneously. How many calls to action are on your website? Make a purchase, sign up for a newsletter, follow us on social media, share this. We're shouting at people with so many different options that actually they feel overwhelmed and they don't pick any one of those options because they're suffering from choice paralysis. There's too much, too much stimulation for system one right take this this is a real example right from amazon's ios app if you try and order a product or pre-order a product and you know that isn't out yet right i do this with video games every now and again you get this two options pre-order this item today and pre-order it now what's the difference you tell me because I'm not sure, and I'm certainly having to think about it. So not only do we need to limit the number of options, we need to make those options distinct from one another. If we have too many options that are too similar to one another, we have to start thinking, and that increases our cognitive load, and that it decreases our conversion rate. So in conclusion, there's so much more I could talk about, but you know, we don't want this to go on forever. Yes, dark patterns work, but there are more effective approaches that you can use to improve conversion. Techniques built around reducing cognitive load by simplifying your site, overcoming analysis paralysis, which is that choice paralysis of too many options, and then also doing things like better matching users' mental models, but we don't have time to get into that today. So there you go. We shall now take some questions. You might want to take a note of some of the um, URLs on the screen. In particular, the last one, if you go to boag.world forward slash dark patterns, you can download this um, slide deck as a PDF with all of the links. Like, for example, um, you know, these, these gray blocks here, they're actually links you can click through. Also, where I, um, I've got quotes from, from articles that I've written, you can click through on those as well. So go to boag.world forward slash dark patterns to download that. I've written an entire beginner's guide to conversion rate optimization, which you can get at boagworld.com forward slash design forward slash conversion dash rate dash optimization. And then I would love to see you at my London workshop where we can dive into your specific site, discuss um, how to make improvements and do things like that and to uh, explore 
the many, many other things that I haven't touched on today. If that sounds of interest, then if you're watching this live, you can click the call to action directly below the screen. Or if you're listening to this as a podcast or watching a video afterwards, you can go to boagworld.com forward slash usability forward slash London dash workshop. Okay, so that about wraps it up. I will close down my slides. Um, and uh, and and we shall focus on my gorgeous face because I know that you're very excited about that. And um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions if people want me to. Um, you can just post those questions in the ask a question option below. I'm not seeing any at the moment, um, which may be because you were listening so intently to everything I've got to say. Um, and if you haven't got questions, that's absolutely fine. You can drop me an email at paul at boagworld afterwards, uh, boagworld.com, I should say, afterwards. But hopefully um, there's been some inspiration there. Hopefully you're now in a position where you can better um, answer uh, you, those people that say you should be using dark patterns. You've got a good argument against it. And more importantly, you've got at least some techniques that you can introduce them to um, that, that are alternatives to dark patterns. And that maybe you've learned a little bit about how to go about presenting those techniques um, in a way that really helps unpack, uh, really focuses on the business benefits rather than we should be doing this because we should be um, being nice to users. So there you go. That's my, my little presentation um, on dark patterns. Thank you very much for um, watching. And uh, until next time, goodbye.